We believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. In other words, we believe in dividing verses to the right group of people and the right time period. Because if you don't do that, then what's going to happen is you're going to combine all the verses together and come up with major wrong doctrine. So one of the verses that we divide is concerning the pre-tribulation and post-tribulation rapture. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is one of the favorite passages next to Matthew 24. One of my members was saying, oh man, we're going to go to Matthew 24 again. We're going to go to Matthew 24 again, like every single Sunday. I told you, that's what post-tribbers do. Post-tribbers, they believe you will go through the tribulation and get raptured. And they have to have Matthew 24 every stinking time. By now, you all know the favorite passage of post-tribulation rapture by now. That's how bad it is. But the thing is, the 2 Thessalonians 2 is probably their best one, their best one. Now, I debunked this passage, but what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to give an expository everything, the whole chapter. We're going to go through everything in the chapter and completely demolish this argument of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, the reason why it proves a post-tribulation rapture is because, am I out of the frame, guys? I feel like I'm too, too left. No? Uh, yeah, yeah, now it's now off. It's, now it's off. It's yeah. right here, right? Okay, it's a good thing I'm... Ke okay. Keep eyes, gentlemen. Keep eyes, techies. All right, keep eyes, techies. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Notice verse 1, our rapture, gathering together. When we get raptured, notice what this is called that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So post-tribbers claim this is called the day of Christ, our rapture together. And notice here that in this day of Christ, so their first argument is that the day of Christ is at hand. So that's a lie. Now, don't we teach that the rapture is imminent? It can happen any moment. Yes. But according to post-tribbers, they say that this is false. Day of Christ at hand. That's the issue. Which means to them that it means imminence. Any moment, it's near. So Paul seems to say when people tell you that the rapture can happen any moment, that it's false. Let's read verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. See that? That's a deception. For that day shall not come. So the day of Christ, which has the rapture, cannot happen, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Notice, until the Antichrist shows up first. Now, pre-tribulation rapture people, Tim LaHaye, John, Ankel, uh, John Ankerberg, I almost said ankle bomb. John Ankelberg and all these other famous pre-tribulation rapture people, they automatically think that verse 3, what it's talking about is that it has nothing to do with post-tribulation rapture. Some even say that you will see the Antichrist and then after that we get raptured. But that's not going to work for pre-tribulation. If you claim you see the Antichrist and then get raptured before the tribulation, that's not going to work because the man of sin be revealed is referring well underway in the middle of the tribulation. Look at verse 4. Who opposeth the Antichrist and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in where? The temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, about the Antichrist again. And then verse 8 and then shall that wicked be revealed. So notice the Antichrist revealed. After what? All these events happening. He has to go in the temple. You notice we read that, right? And that occurs well underway in the tribulation. So that's not going to work. Now the key is this, is that these two arguments can be debunked by scripture with scripture and by just looking at the chapter too. It's that simple. Context and scripture with scripture. So they claim Antichrist, First, then rapture. So, proving a post-tribulation rapture. All right, let's debunk this one at a time. First of all, let's go 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's go through verse by verse again, right? The whole context again. Verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by what? Our gathering together unto him. So notice it's not just a rapture. It's also the coming of Jesus Christ. And then verse 2 calls that the day of Christ. So here's the answer. The day of Christ, you've got to understand, is including not just a rapture for Christians. It is also referring to the coming of Jesus Christ. When does he come down and take over the world? It's Armageddon. So the coming of Jesus Christ. We call it second advent, right? So we call this the second coming. And then here's the tribulation. Ah, now things are starting to make sense. So this day of Christ is referring to what? Like this. No wonder, see, that's why the Antichrist has to show up first. Why? The Antichrist has to show up first, then the day of Christ, see that? The day of Christ, which is not just this, but this event, can occur, can happen. That's the answer to that. Now, the answer, the question also is this. How do we know that in verse 1, the coming of Jesus Christ is referring to to the, sometime after the tribulation when he comes down at Armageddon. So what, how do we know that? Because they will argue that the coming of Jesus Christ in verse 1 is referring to the rapture. They think coming of Christ and our gathering together is all referring to the rapture. That is not true. Context again. We read chapter 2 verse 1, correct? All right. Now let's go by context. Context. Let's start off at verse 7, chapter 1 and verse 7. Chapter 1, verse 7, and go all the way down till we reach chapter 2. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, from the, what? Presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall, what? Come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So notice right here that the context, the coming of Jesus Christ, he's not talking about here, we're raptured up to heaven. He's talking about what? You read that passage. This is Armageddon. He comes down and conquers his enemies. So that's pretty plain. So the context of chapter 1 proves that this is what it's talking about. But not only that, go to chapter 2 again. Go to chapter 2 again. What was Paul talking about coming? Look at chapter 2 verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Remember the Antichrist man of sin revealed first, right? then the day of Christ can occur? What did he mean by that? Then Antichrist reveal first, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Ah, remember chapter 1, he burns up his enemies, he destroys them. But keep reading, and shall destroy with the what? Brightness of his coming. Boom! So chapter 2 even proves it as well. So now we know it has to refer to Armageddon. That's why... Antichrist revealed, wicked revealed, right? No, oh, what am I doing with my English? <laughs> so notice right here, he is revealed first. That's why, what did verse 1 say? Coming of Christ and gathering together. It's not just our gathering together rapture, but coming as well. Then what? The day of Christ occurs when this guy is revealed first, boom, scripture with scripture and context. We looked at context so far. But not only that, keep your hand at 2 Thessalonians 2 and go to Matthew 20, excuse me, look at Matthew 24. Yes, somebody shouted that, see? Matthew 24. 
you know what, I, I'm fair to the post-tribulation rapture side. I mean, I got members in my church who know where to find a post-tribulation rapture compared to Stephen Anderson's church and Roger Jimenez's church and all those lackeys out there, churches who have members that don't know where the verse is for a post-tribulation rapture. But my members do. They just spit out automatically, oh, Matthew 24, you know, like that. See, we're fair. We're very fair people. Now look at Matthew chapter 24 and look at verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the what? Coming of the Son of Man be. What is this coming of the Son of Man? Oh, it's a post-tribulation rapture. It's a rapture of Christians. No, keep reading verse 28. For wheresoever the what? Carcass is, there will the what? Eagles be gathered together. That's Armageddon. Did you read Revelation 19? Jump to Revelation 19. I hope that your hands, that's 2 Thessalonians 2, remember. Go to jump to Revelation 19. See that we've looked at, you know what proves this is talking about Armageddon right here? It's because we looked at context and scripture with scripture. So they got nothing except there is absolutely no doubt. To say this is post-tribulation rapture then is what? Private interpretation then. That has to be. Because we looked at the context itself and we even looked at scripture with scripture. Now jump to Revelation 19. Revelation 19, <coughs> excuse me. And we will read verse... 11, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Ah, remember that fire from his coming at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and not only that, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 as well. Verse 15, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Remember 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 said, in his coming, out of his mouth he slaughters the enemies. And then keep reading. Verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the, what? Fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains. No doubt, the coming of the Son of Man right here in Matthew 24 and Revelation 19 is referring to Armageddon. Why? Because Matthew 24 told you the coming of the Son of Man is where the eagles will be gathered together to eat up the carcass. Revelation 19 told you that it is Armageddon where the eagles are gathered together and they eat up the carcass. Chapter 19, Revelation 19, well past the tribulation. See that? Now, we're not done. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians 2. You, if you think that was thorough enough, we're not done yet. This is totally thorough. We're going to go through the whole chapter, like I said. This is their strongest passage, and we're going to annihilate it completely. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 now. Verse 2, that he be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. What? These people are troubled about what? The day of Christ is at hand. That's not true. Paul never said when the rapture if the day of Christ is what they argue about a rapture for Christians, you know what? You should not be troubled about it. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. Keep your hand at 2 Thessalonians 2. Forever, forever, until the end of this video, all right? We're going to go back and forth there. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. Now one of my other members is going to say, oh, 2 Thessalonians 2, good for you. you now you know the two top verses that post-trippers use. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 17, then, which we are, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. See, our gathering, the rapture. Verse 18, wherefore be troubled and trembled. No, not shaken or troubled. Wherefore what? Comfort one another with these words. So let's go back at 2 Thessalonians 2 then. They're not afraid that the rapture is soon. No, if the rapture is soon, you know what we're supposed to be? Comforted. Not troubled. What should you be troubled about? That would make sense. 
Oh, no, I don't think so. Oh, come on. Now look at chapter 1 again, 2 Thessalonians 1. We know that's Armageddon, the coming, right? Verse 7, and to you who are what? Troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Look at that. You see that? What they're troubled about is his coming, okay? When they are troubled about the day of Christ is at hand, they're not thinking about, oh, it's the rapture, it's the rapture. No, what they're thinking about is this day of Christ in its fullness. This is what they're fearful about. Now, not only that, if you think, oh, that's just private interpretation. Look, we looked at context, chapter 1. We also saw scripture with scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4, but let's do scripture with scripture again. If we're afraid that, verse 2, the day of Christ is at hand, then look at Romans 13. Keep your hand at, I know, I know. Okay, good. Memorize the 2 Thessalonians 2. Keep your hand there, obviously. Go to Romans 13 now. Romans 13. This should be thorough enough, but I'm not done. See, we're going to totally annihilate this. This is our strongest post-trib rapture, but I prove to you undoubtedly context and scripture with scripture what it is. Now let's go to Romans chapter 13, verse 12. Oh, to teach the day of Christ is at hand, the rapture is at hand, you should be troubled and afraid. No, Paul said the opposite. You should say it's at hand. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse 12. The night is far spent, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, let's start with verse 11, actually, that's better. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Look at that, see? We're waiting for that day when our body is saved. That time is at hand. It's coming near. Look at verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at what? Hand. See, that's the total opposite. So now you got Romans chapter 13. So this is debunked. This thing is debunked with 1 Thessalonians 4 and Romans 13 and context of 2 Thessalonians 1 and from the top of my memory, 7. Look at that. Well, then what did Paul mean right here at hand? Look at Scripture with Scripture. Let's look at John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Let me ask you a simple question. If you look up the phrase at hand, does that have to mean near? Or can that also mean, which is why, think about this, that's why modern Bible scholar, what did they write? Already here. Because why? The phrase at hand or even the Greek, because modern scholars saw that, they knew that it can also mean not just near, but it's already here. So you see that? What they're worried about, yeah, you better be troubled, that the day of Christ is already here. So I'm going through this tribulation event where the Antichrist revealed, and Jesus is coming to wipe me out. You better believe that they're troubled about that. But if they thought that they were raptured to heaven beforehand, and they didn't have to go through this, then they wouldn't be in trouble. Oh, that's not what it means. You made it up. No, go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And look how the scriptures define itself. We're going to look at John <coughs> chapter 7. And we will read verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now... The Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was what? At hand. It's already occurring. If you read down verse 3, the brethren went there because of Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, Jesus encouraged them to go to the feast. Verse 9, verse 10, he also went there to join the feast. Verse 11, the feast was occurring. And then from verse 11 and onward, that's where the feast was occurring. It's already there. If you doubt me, now go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Scripture with Scripture. Shows everything. Scripture with Scripture. 
Oh, uh, I'm convinced now, Pastor. Oh, no, no. We're going to keep going. All right? We're going to keep going. I'm going to get that post-tribulation -tribu out of you. I'm going to beat that post-trib out of you. All right? <laughs> I'm going to kick that devil out of you. Amen. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Verse 45, Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us, behold, uh, let us be going. Behold, he, Judas Iscariot, is what? At hand that doth betray me. He's already here. See that? He's already here. Let me give you a more plain one. You'll be laughing at this. Go to 1 Samuel 9. 1 Samuel 9. 1 Samuel 9. Let's be so thorough. Let's be so thorough right here. You can't use 2 Thessalonians 2. You should be convinced by now. You should be convinced by now. By context, scripture with scripture. We literally went through everything here. Now let's go to 1 Sam, uh, Samuel, excuse me, 1 Samuel <coughs> chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. And you're going to notice right here what the Bible says about Saul and his servant. We're going to see what they say right here. We're going to look at verse 8. And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here, already here, at what? Hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. Oh, the shekel of silver is nearby. It's any moment now. No, it's already here. See? At hand, that phrase, and now it sounds like a duh statement. At hand means what? At hand. It's like already here. It does not have to mean near or any moment every stinking time. It can also mean it's already here. You don't need Greek to look that up. Now let's go back to 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2. This chapter should prove pre-tribulation rapture. You might ask why. Because they're afraid of going through the tribulation where the Antichrist is here. And then Armageddon comes down and God wipes it all out. That's what they're afraid of. Paul's comforting them. You're not going to be in this time period where God's going to eventually come down and wipe his enemies. You're going to be raptured before then. Now, let's, if you don't believe me, let's keep reading, okay? We saw verse 2. Paul was trying to encourage them. Look, that Armageddon thing is not coming any moment. Verse 3 he explains the Antichrist has to be here first. Verse 4, this is well under the way of the tribulation. He has to sit in the temple first. And not only that, you're going to notice right here, verse 7, he describes the Antichrist. Verse 8, he describes the Antichrist. When then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse 9, he describes the destruction of the Antichrist. Verse 10 and 11 and 12, he's describing people who are in the tribulation under the terror of the Antichrist and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in you or in them. Them that perish because you, no, they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Paul, notice, is contrasting, distinguishing them in the tribulation during the Antichrist from you. He describes, verse 8, the Antichrist, what? When he's revealed, see, during the tribulation when he's revealed, there comes that destruction, that deception, whereas for you, you will be raptured. No, you just made that last line up. No, keep reading. Verse 13, but, see, contrasting, from those in the tribulation, but what? We are bound to give thank always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. See, if you're, ha, are you that saved Christian? Yes, if you're a saved Christian, colon, colon. If you got saved, what happens? Whereunto he called you by our gospel, right? If you got saved by the gospel, what happens? To the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Boom. You get raptured with Jesus Christ up in glory. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. 
Pastor Kim's making things up. Pastor Kim's making things up. No, you just made things up with only four simple verses about a post-tribulation rapture. You made it up. I went all through the, I, I exhausted that whole chapter, Amen. went through context Amen. and scripture with scripture. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, right? When he comes down and appears, what happens? Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Boom. See, you, when Jesus Christ comes down, we get raptured to heaven. We're in glory with him. Boom. So right here in Colossians chapter 3, it's proof. So another point right here is that Colossians 3 and the context of 2 Thessalonians 2 and not only 2 but chapter 1. Remember Paul was trying to comfort them at chapter 1? Rest with us when he comes down to destroy the enemy. See, Paul was trying to teach them at chapter 1 and chapter 2 what? You're not going to be here. Boom, that should be it. Second Thessalonians 2, that's a plain as a nose on your face and that that should be pre-tribulation rapture. You're not going to go through the tribulation. That's for them during the Antichrist. We were called up to the rapture. But if you still don't believe me, all right, I still don't believe you. Okay, then you're blind. I'm sorry. But I will just give one more argument, all right, to make you happy, all right? Verse 14 Verse 15, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Paul says at verse 15 and 16, because of verse 14, where you're going to get raptured, you should stand fast, hold the tradition. Compare that with 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And the rapture, right? <clears throat> You'll notice at verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The rapture, right? Because of that rapture, notice the similar wording he gives at 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 58. Therefore, because of that rapture, therefore, my beloved brethren, be what? Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That preaching is, style is similar with what? You saw 2 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. Because of the rapture, that's why I continue. We're not done. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 17. I lied. That was my last argument. I'm going to give it one final argument now. The final argument. This should be thorough. Not only 15, uh, 15 and 16 proved it, 17 definitely prove it. What does the first part say? Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. What, what happened at 1 Thessalonians? Uh, if you forgot, then 1 Thessalonians 4, right? You don't have to turn there, but I'll read it. 1 Thessalonians 4. 17. Rapture, then we which are alive and remain shall be cut up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Rapture. Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Boom. Paul was saying, you're going to get raptured, so be in comfort. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be here at this time period. So we saw Colossians 3, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 Thessalonians 1, but we also have to add 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. By the way, these are the only two, rap, uh, two chapters on the Christian rapture, actually, Christian rapture. And that matches perfectly with the language of what he's using as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There is no doubt. Paul, he was trying to give a distinguishing that you, that you will not go through this horrendous event where Jesus Christ is going to come down at the end as well and wipe out everybody. He's saying you're going to avoid all that. You're going to get raptured up to heaven. Well, what is this then, Pastor? The reason why Paul said these things is to comfort them that they are not already in this time period of the tribulation. But um, unfortunately, Stephen Anderson did not see it that way. 
Paul was trying to, they're thinking we're going to go through the tribulation, but Paul's trying to tell, no, be in comfort. You're not going to go through that time period. He was telling them you're going to get raptured. Be in comfort. This tribulation did not occur yet, Paul explained to them. Why? Because you have to have the falling away first and the Antichrist reveal. So you're not going through the tribulation where Jesus Christ is going to come down the, the end and wipe out everybody. He was preaching a pre-tribulation rapture sermon as 2 Thessalonians 2. <gasps> Shock! And let's end. <laughs>